Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we're getting enthusiastic about verbs and how they make sentences happen. But first, Gretchen's book has a release date, and I'm very excited. I am so excited. Uh, the book is going to be coming out on July 23rd, 2019. That's very soon, and you can pre-order it now. I have maybe already read the book, and I'm so excited to. I'm just It's going to be the thing that I buy everyone uh, for the next year. If you invite me to your birthday party or your wedding uh, <laughs> or your graduation ceremony in the next 12 months, uh, you'll get a lovely gift-wrapped copy of Gretchen's book. Uh, Please invite Lauren to everything so she can buy more <laughs> copies of the book. Uh, and you too can pre-order the book by following the links in the description. Uh, it's on the usual places that you get books. And pre-orders are super important because they help the publisher know how many copies to print, which is hopefully lots of copies because the book's going to be very popular, we hope. Between your book and Peter's book, I feel like I've learned so much about this world of non-academic publishing and it's fascinating. And I hadn't realized just how much pre-orders matter in this thing. They're super important. I uh, you know, now I need to pre-order everything because of how important I realized it was. And it's kind of fun because it's like a present from your past self to your future self because Aww. then you get this book that just shows up when it's out uh, and you don't have to remember about it. You can use the convenience of Amazon or you can use your local indie bookseller if you want to support them. Yeah, indie bookstores love pre-orders because it's also a guaranteed sale for them. And so you can use sites like IndieBound, which help you find uh, your local indie bookstore to pre-order from. Uh, so you can pre-order the book. It's called Because Internet. Uh, oh, yeah, we should tell people that small detail. <laughs> yeah, it's called Because Internet. It is a lot easier to search for uh, than the word lingthusiasm because it is composed of two pre-existing English words, not a word we made up. True. Uh, so you can search for Because Internet, Understanding the New Rules of Language, uh, wherever good books are sold. And yeah, I'm excited to get to share it with people. Verbs. They're so great. I, I like really them. like verbs. They've got real personality. Yeah. I like, especially like all the stuff you can do to make stuff verbs when it wasn't trying to be originally. I feel like there's a lot of like grammatical anxiety when you ask people what's a verb. There's this instant like, oh, it's a, it's a doing word. And that is sure. That is a, a definition that might get you so far. But I there are so many better definitions. I first learned about word, verbs from Mad Libs. Remember those things where they had like the blanks and they'd be like, put in a verb. And then it would be like, put in an adverb, put in an adjective. Like I ran down slowly from the treehouse uh, and fell into my fluffy dog or but something like But you could this. say, I jumped down slowly from the treehouse and hugged my fluffy dog. Exactly. So you could like put in these different versions. Um, and it was, I don't know how baby Gretchen learned about parts of speech. So, yeah, I have this kind of fond Mad Libs associated memory of verbs, but yeah, I think when we get presented with like, here's a list of verbs, here's a list of nouns, it seems like they don't, they don't cross over much. And that you're, you're, it, it supposes that the way you learn what different verbs are is just to memorize lists, which is a terrible thing to do. Yeah, it's not fun at all. So I like to think of a verbs are things that act like verbs, which of course then brings up the rather large question of, well, what does it mean to act like a verb? That is the most circular definition I've ever heard. <laughs> what? So what do you do next if you've caught yourself in the circle? What is the definition so of a verb? when I'm trying to figure out, okay, here's this word that I'm encountering. Is it acting like a verb? Can I make it act like a verb? I put it in a sentence where it's forced to act like a verb and see what happens. Okay. So if I want to take, um, let's take a, let's take a brand new fake word, um, like blorp. Right, fake word, yeah. You know, here's blorp, not a pre-existing English word. Sounds like it could be. So if I want to say, can blorp be used as a verb, um, then I might say something like, I blorped you, I, or I'm blorping right now. Okay, I blorped out of the treehouse. I blorped out of the treehouse and ran down the hill. Uh, and so stuff that can fit in this frame, the things that you do with verbs, which is that verbs are kind of the the scaffolding or the backbone or the the thing that everything else in the sentence can hang on to. Right. And so when you use a verb where you have all of these, these hangers on or these other bits of the sentence body <laughs> hanging on to them, you can see, okay, does this sound like 
the normal use of this word already? Or does this sound like it's a new thing that I'm kind of pushing that word into? I like this idea of them providing the structure, but I, I worry since we're going to talk a lot in this episode about rearranging the structure, that maybe using like a spine metaphor might be <laughs> a little bit too Frankenstein, a little bit too gross. Um, so maybe we should go for a metaphor that's like a little less animate. Okay. Okay. Um, what about a coat rack? Okay. Yeah, that could work. Okay. So if a verb is like the coat rack and the nouns uh, and the other bits of the sentence are like the coats and stuff that hang off on the coat rack. Then different verbs come with different hooks. Yeah. Yeah, that yeah works. I'm into this. So can you put a word in a place where it's it's supporting a lot of different other parts of the sentence? And does that sound normal or does that sound like it's an innovation? So if you take a word like internet, for example, yeah, and you say, I'm going to internet right now. Mm-hmm. Or I've got a lot of interneting to do. Yeah. Or let's just internet that and see what the answer is. That's using internet like a verb. And you have this kind of feeling that that's a novel thing to do, or it's a relatively new thing to do. And the kind of canonical use of internet is more like, what's on the internet right now? Or the internet is messy, which is like a very noun. The internet is a weird place. You know, uh, that's a very noun use of internet. You could use it as a verb and you can, I mean, you can do use anything as a verb if you try hard enough. But the question of like, is it is it a verb is often, is it a pre-established verb that lots of people use it as a verb? Or is this like a new thing that you're doing to it that's like verbing it? Yeah. So you can verb verb, but the word verb is canonically a noun. People get really upset when you talk about verbing stuff. Yeah, there's this kind of Calvin and Hobbes quote, like verbing weird's language, which of course is using weird as a verb. And again, like you can you can make any word into a verb if you try hard enough. But some some words are already kind of prepackaged as verbs, and some you have to put a little bit of effort in. And when you used blorp, mm-hmm. you said I'm blorping right now, which yeah. is like I'm blorping. So there's one hook for I'm, whereas I said I'm blorping out of the treehouse. So I've got I'm is one hook, and out of the treehouse is another. So we've used the same – well, we, we possibly use different made-up verbs because we don't really know what blorp means yet. <laughs> We're doing this all backwards. Um, well, yeah, and not often, you know, you start with the meaning. Uh, or if I say, like, I'm blorping you or I blorped that to you, yeah. then I've got I've got two hooks, I, I and you, or three hooks, I'm blorping that to you. And we still don't know what blorping is, but we know that it can support – these, you know, in, if it's our coat rack, it can support the hooks that contain I and you and that. We've already talked a little bit in episode nine about constituency, which is this idea that language isn't just a random throwing together of words. It's not just a bucket of balls. It's actually got this structure. And if you have one word, it kind of comes with these other words. And verbs are a really great example of constituency and how just one verb can bring all these other things to the sentence. Yeah, it can bring them or it can support them if they're already there. Like it's it's creating this thing that that things are mentioned around. I I think my, one of my formative experiences with verbs after Mad Libs um, <laughs> was when I was studying Latin in high school. Mm-hmm. And one of the things about Latin is that you can put the words in almost kind of any order. And especially in poetry, they really rearrange the words a lot because you want to line up the ones that rhyme or you want to line up the words for a particular rhythm. Mm -hmm. And so that means you can have like a verb and its nouns in like totally different lines in totally different parts of the sentence. And so you're trying to figure out when you're translating Latin poetry, because that's what you do in intro Latin class. You don't learn how to like ask Caesar where to buy a pizza, Um, (laughs) much as maybe that would be useful. Uh, You... So you're translating Latin poetry, and so you're going through these lines and being like, hey, I need to figure out, like, what the verbs are, how many of them there are, Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, generally, like, underline them, and then figure out which nouns are associated with which verbs. And then I can figure out which adjectives are associated with which nouns and so on down the line, so I can figure out what's actually going on in the sentence. And conveniently, languages have different ways of telling different types of hooks on coat racks, so which ones are the nouns that belong with particular verbs and in what order. And I think... We should definitely say at the outset that there are lots of different hooks and lots of different ways to arrange them on coat racks, both within a particular language and across the world's languages. Yeah, absolutely. So I think thinking about this kind of verb as coat rack, noun as 
coats that you can you can hook onto that is a way of kind of entering into this. And there's a huge descriptive tradition of talking about each of these different types of relationships between the number of hooks you can have and where they are and what kinds of hooks they are and what they look like with all these specific names that are often used there. But it's easy to get bogged down in terminology and think that like you have to memorize all this terminology just in order to understand this central idea, which is that verbs support nouns and verbs create the conditions under which nouns can flourish. And and you can have certain some some numbers of nouns to do that. So I think that's kind of the big insight here. And I think you can then walk into the terminology and have a little bit more confidence. So you already understand the basic concepts involved. And often you find that different languages will have the same number of hooks. They might be arranged differently for reasons of the particular word order of a subject of a of a language. So if you speak English, hopefully you can kind of think for yourself the verb is in the middle. There's this really great example of that that uses the kind of I heart and Y thing that you put on t-shirts. Oh, yeah. It's as minimal as possible. <laughs> exactly. So I is the subject, the heart is the verb, and New York is the object. And then, so English is I heart and Y, and then other languages are I and Y heart, or heart, I, and Y, and so on and so forth down the line. And languages that use other ways of telling which is which, and so they can go in any order, like Latin. And so sometimes the hooks are in particular order because the language says this is the instructions for how to build it, but um, each each verb has its own instructions for how many hooks to start with. And I think that gets us into initially, what do we mean by number of hooks? What are some what are some differences between different types of hook numbers? Okay. So you have your kind of maybe your simplest sentence, which is like one hook, one noun. And these are verbs that kind of that support, you know, basically one noun most of the time. Uh, so something like I'm sleeping. Yeah. That supports the I. I have to say, if this was an actual coat rack, you were getting a bad deal on your coat rack. <laughs> like you can just use a coat hanger and put that in your closet. You don't need a coat yeah, rack. Yeah, this metaphorical coat rack, like often a, a regular coat rack will actually let you hang like six or eight coats. Like there aren't a lot of sentences that let you do that. This is a... This is a metaphorical coat rack with very few hooks. Yeah. (laughs) But your simplest kind of metaphorical coat rack has one hook. uh, I sleep. I am sleeping. I dance. You dance. Mm -hmm. You know, the dog is sleeping. These are, these are some individual coats that you can hook onto that, that metaphorical coat rack. Should we compare that to some that have two just to give people some contrast? So something like I ate. You've got here an example, I ate the apple, but I always use the example, I ate the cake, because it's more real life. <laughs> I, I I support a diet that includes both cake and apples. <laughs> yeah. This message brought to you by. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I ate the cake, I ate the apple, both of those. So cake or apple is, is the kind of thing that can go on that second hook. But crucially, you could say I ate the cake and the apple. And the and there lets you hang a cake and apple on the same hook. Mm-hmm. But you can't say something like I ate the cake, the apple. No. That just sounds weird. Because you're trying to add another hook where it shouldn't be. You're trying to, like, cram two coats onto one hook, but you're not giving them any means of, like, relating to each other. You're just like, no, both of you, go here. And it's like, no, we we can't fit here. I'm sorry. Uh, But you could do something like, I ate. Have you eaten it? Yeah, I ate. Yeah. Obviously implying cake and or apples, but not Well, or food in general. Yeah. You know, so some verbs let you kind of imply an object, uh, but... You know, you could say something like, I ate rocks, you know, as a child. I mean, you could say that. (laughs) But if you just say, I ate, that doesn't generally imply rocks. It generally implies a sort of food. Mm -hmm. Unless you're like a rock-eating creature from science fiction, in which case maybe it's okay. So we've got some one hooks. We've got some two hooks. Uh, Can we we get some more hooks happening? Yeah. So we can get another hook. Uh, If you have something like give, you can be like, I gave you the cake. Because I'm mm, a very thanks. nice person. Thank you, Gretchen. <laughs> uh, I gave you the cake or I gave the cake to you, both of which kind of have three hooks yep. um, to put these three different Or I objects. sent you a letter. I so. sent you a letter. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, I mean, I s- more realistically, I sent you a text message. <laughs> <laughs> we're updating examples for the 21st century. Um, yeah, I sent I sent you a letter. I sent you a postcard. I sent you a DM on Twitter. <laughs> um, so yeah, these these are these are different kinds of hooks that you can have on send or give. So it would be weird to say I sent you. I mean, you could say that, but it means something very different. I made you go somewhere. Yeah, I sent you, or something like I sent you to the store to buy more cake. 
Yeah. You know, there's, I, I, I sent you to the stories. So to the store is kind of interesting here because I could just say I sent you, but I also have this option of adding on something to the store or I sent you a message on Monday. Yeah. And there's these additional sorts of things you you could add on, but they aren't required. They're not as, like, the hooks are very fixed into the coat rack. These are more, like, distinct, like, extra hangers. Yeah, okay. So you can kind of drape extra hangers on your coat rack. I like how this metaphor is going. <laughs> this is a much more realistic coat rack all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm really glad we didn't do the Frankenstein thing. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> so this is a, it becomes a bit of a messy coat rack like many of us probably have at home. Uh, and so these stuff like on Monday, you know, to the store with great alacrity, uh, you can you can kind of drape extra things onto a sentence kind of indefinitely. Like you can just keep piling stuff on there, but it only comes with a few hooks that are actually screwed into the coat rack itself. So there's a few fixed things, but then we can just keep adding and enriching. And the same thing goes, so, you know, I gave you a book cake. Book cake, like a cake made out of books or a book about cakes? <laughs> so this is the thing, as long if we can figure out a way to bundle together book cake, like maybe it's a cake that looks like a book, mm-hmm. then we can hang those both on the same hook. But if we can't figure out how to bundle them together, like I gave you a book, a cake... I, no, I can't even fabricate a meaning for that. <laughs> then those aren't hanging on the on the hook together properly. Yeah. Um, and this is what we mean when we say like a, a verb tends to have kind of a specific number of nouns that it goes with. It's an ungrammatical coat rack. <laughs> <laughs> the anti-grammatical coat rack. Um, the other one that I really love is coat racks. Okay, so you probably can't get this at Ikea, but you can get a metaphorical sentence coat rack with no hooks at all. Uh, okay. That's just called a pole graph. <laughs> so, like, definitely don't try to buy this. It's going to be pretty useless for you. But sentence-wise, it's very interesting. Okay. Because you can get verbs like, it's raining. True. If I say, it's a cake, that one's pretty good. Like, we we know what it is. This is a cake or something like this. Yeah. Um, or you're a cake, which is probably an insult. I don't know. I, I'm I'm okay with being okay. That, that's kind of a real it there. It's doing something. But if I say it's raining, I can't say you're raining. That is true. <laughs> or you're snowing or, uh, you know, the, the dog is raining. Like it uh, is not a regular coat compared to like dog or you or these other nouns. That they're proper coats that we can hang on a, on a hook. But it is... Maybe it's like one of those kind of like fake rain ponchos that like doesn't really work like a coat, but you kind of keep it around in your in your purse in a little plastic container just in case you need like a bad coat. Awkwardly hang it on your hookless. And we know that English is weird in terms of this using what I call dummy it. Um, I mean, not me personally. That's just how I, I learned about it. Um, but this dummy it form is just there because rain – as a verb doesn't have any hooks and English freaks out and goes, Oh, I better add, I better add something. It would, it's just a pole. I need to make it look like a coat rack. Well, and this is the thing that's, that's interesting about verbs in particular is that this is how we know that rain is still a verb, even though it's not actually supporting any real nouns because it has to support a fake noun because of verbs like, I just, I just, I just need a noun. Yeah. I wouldn't be a coat rack. I'd be a pole. <laughs> just, just. Just pretend that one's there, even if it's not really there. But you get all sorts of like other things happening with words like this in, in other languages. So in some languages that don't actually require you to have a, a pronoun like it. So like in Spanish, you can say like llueve, which just means rains. Okay. But that's that's all you need. And it's still got that like, it's still got the ending that you would have if it was he or she or it rains. It's just that that he or she or it doesn't actually refer to a specific person in the same way that it's raining doesn't refer to a specific person. Right. Whereas I had the opposite when I learned Nepali. I had to remember that the for, to say it's raining, you have to say pani por decha, which is rain is falling or rain is raining. Oh, rain is raining. So yeah. you do need a real noun there. It just has to be always the same noun. Well, because you can also say it's snowing or it's But does that other... is that like snow is snowing or snow is raining? Snow is it's just a kind of general falling, precipitating verb. So, okay. but you have to specify an actual. You have to have a real coat, a real noun. I guess there. that's kind of like like the sun is out versus the clouds are out, or whereas the is out isn't isn't doing much or something like that. And then you have the opposite. So in English, you could have a sentence like 
flood rains down on the city. This is very post-apocalyptic, Elvis. For someone who didn't want the, like, spine (laughs) metaphor, I just go straight into the, like, emo uh, dystopia. And that's another reason you know that rain is a real verb sometimes, because sometimes you could have something rain, or, like, tears rain down my face. Oh, also cheerful. (laughs) Gosh, our novel is going to be so compelling. Well, and this is kind of interesting, because when I was learning German, uh, I also learned about this thing you can do in German and presumably some other languages, but not English. Um, where you can make these kinds of what they called impersonal constructions, but for other verbs that aren't like weather verbs. Oh. So in German, you can say es wurde getanzt, which means something like there was dancing or like it danced. Oh, that's nice. And that means like people danced, we danced, there was dancing yep. in the rain, maybe. Um, and this doesn't mean in the same way that that it's, it's kind of impersonal. So when you translate it in English, you use one of these various constructions, but in structure, it's a lot more parallel to like es regne, it rains. Hmm. Cool. So again, different languages have slightly different approaches to the coat rack and the number of hooks. But they're all reflecting this idea that like, you know, there isn't necessarily a, a real person happening here. And you can kind of do a similar thing. I'm thinking of your, of your Nepali example with, so some verbs in English that normally only have really one hook can in some contexts, get a second one, but only a specific one. So you can say, like, I'm sleeping, mm-hmm. and you can't normally sleep something. Like, can't say, I slept a nap. No. <laughs> I mean, you could, but I'm going to flag that as not likely to be grammatical. Yeah, like, I, I maybe I could try, but, but you can say, like, I slept the sleep of the just. True. Or I dreamed a dream of infamy. Mm-hmm. I don't know why I'm really pretentious right now. Because that's the only thing you can do if you want to add more hooks to sleep. Yeah, like I dreamed a dream of times gone by, which I think is a line from Les Mis. Uh, and so, you know, you can you can you can only dream a dream. You can sleep a sleep. Can I nap a nap? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, so there's there's kind of limitations on on what you can do with, but you can kind of add this extra hook, but it's like a fake hook that only gets one thing on it. Okay, so we've got our one hook, two hook. Three hook. Our one hook includes our weird dummy it hook. Zero hook. Kind Zero of. zero-ish hook. Can we can we add more? Can we get to four? So yeah, I was looking at examples of this, and there is a four hook one. Um, some people analyze the English word bet as having four hooks. So you okay. could say like, I bet you five dollars on Usain Bolt that he'll like win the race. Right. Okay. He uh, was the only sports person Gretchen and I could both identify off the top of our heads who you would safely bet five dollars on. I mean, I could bet you five dollars on Usain Bolt, but I think you would not take this bet because probably he's going to win. Probably, yeah. Um, so yeah, you can you can bet a person money on a, another person or thing or animal or something that might win, um, and it seems like bet can maybe accomplish this because I bet you so. I and you, that's mm-hmm. two. Five dollars is another coat. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's a cheap coat, but you know. And then Usain Bolt is a very fancy very fast coat. coat. Very fancy yeah. coat. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like maybe maybe up to four. Uh, again, I wouldn't necessarily buy this coat rack at IKEA because even four hooks is not that many. But it does show you that verbs come with all this structure. Just a single three letter word like bet can potentially come with up to four other bits of information built into the structure. Yeah, exactly. And without bet, this whole sentence isn't working. If I just say I U five dollars on Usain Bolt, this is not working. Again, gonna point out, probably not grammatical. <laughs> Whereas something like I bet you five dollars, or I bet five dollars on Usain Bolt, or bet you five dollars on Usain Bolt, if you drop one of these nouns, it's like not as much of a problem. Yeah. Uh whereas the verb is really providing the scaffolding or the support or the the hooks for the rest of the sentence to happen. We've been talking about coat racks and hooks, but you may actually recognize the the terminology that all of this refers to, which is transitivity. It's a, a verby word that comes up when people learn grammar. Yeah, so transitivity takes as a metaphor that a sentence goes across, because this is from the Latin word to go across, like to translate um, or to transport. And so it goes across from the subject to the object. Uh, if you have a transitive sentence, it goes, you know, I see the book. Mm-hmm. Um, or a sentence that doesn't go across, I slept. Um, that's a kind of core metaphor when it comes to transitivity. It's just that this metaphor kind of has a bit of a difficult time with the sentences that have 
zero hooks and four hooks and some of these further expansions beyond what the original grammatical tradition had. So we're kind of looking at it with a different metaphor. So once we have a verb, we can kind of get an idea for how many hooks it probably has as a default. But that doesn't mean we can't rearrange the hooks. Our coat rack is actually quite modular and flexible and we can play around with it, which is a lot of fun. Yes, this is a kind of DIY home improvement project. Uh, One of my favorites is you can say something like, I made you read the book. Mm. So in contrast to regular, I read the book, you read the book, I made you read the book. This make is just is introducing another hook. So you can, you have, I made you read the book. Now you have three hooks on a verb that formerly only had two. So we can add hooks that way. There's another way to add a hook, which is to say, I baked a cake for you, Oh, Gretchen. thank you. Thank you. Um, so by adding the for there, um, I've, I've added another reason to have a hook. I made you bake a cake for me. We're adding hooks all over the place. <laughs> now we've got four hooks. You can just keep, keep adding them on top of each other. In English, we use verbs to do this. But just to specify why we're calling this adding hooks um, is because in other languages, they don't necessarily use other verbs to make these extra hooks appear. They use bits of morphemes and, and bits of words. Yeah. Well, so English, we use a verb to 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 make it someone cause something to do something. I made you bake the cake mm-hmm. or I caused you to bake the cake. But when I bake the cake for you, I added that with a preposition. True. And so those look like they're different ways of adding things. But in some languages, all of those different types of meaning are expressed by, say, adding one of the same type of little particle or adding one of the same type of little affix onto the verb. So there are good reasons to group them together when you consider languages as a group. Not just English. We're not yeah. just thinking about English coat racks today. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's this is a kind of thing when you when you group them all together, it, it pays out in the long run. You have another form of adding hooks that I had never heard of this terminology before, but I kind of love it. And we're just going to tell people what the the terminology is. So the terminology for this one. So the other ones have kind of complicated sounding names like causative and benefactive, which like it's fine. They're, They're useful if you know Latin. But these ones are called the spray load alternation. And what I love about the spray load alternation is it contains examples right in the name, which I think more words should do. So you can say something like I sprayed the walls with paint. Or I sprayed paint onto the walls. Hmm, yeah, true. Or say something like, I loaded the truck with hay, I loaded hay onto the truck. And in both cases, you have kind of two main hooks. I sprayed the walls or I sprayed paint. Yeah. And you have one additional hook that's kind of like our coat rack hook that's being added on, like with paint or onto the walls. But you can alternate which one you want to make the main hook that's attached to the coat rack proper and the one that's like the more peripheral one that's kind of your coat hanger one that's further away with the preposition there. So there's a whole list of words that have this alternation. It's kind of nifty that there's just like, I don't know, a couple dozen words in English that do this kind of thing. And there are people who you know, go through and make lists of the words that belong to different types of categories like this because you want to maybe use them in like psycholinguistic experiments where you can test like what happens if you give people certain types of pictures? What do they look at first? If you mm-hmm. give them, I sprayed the walls with paint versus I sprayed paint onto the walls, you can give them a, the same drawing and see where they look first and these kinds of things. Those examples are about adding hooks or deciding what's a hook and what's a coat hanger. It is also possible to remove hooks from sentences uh, so if I have something like, I broke the vase, Gretchen would have, I broke the vase, I believe. Yeah, I think I say, I break, we'll, broke the vase. We'll say that's the same sentence. <laughs> um, so I broke the vase, I and the vase, I've got two coats hanging up there. But if I had a sentence like, the vase was broken, who knows how? Maybe it was the dog, maybe it was me. I can't tell because I don't have that second hook anymore. I've only got one for the vase. Yeah. And so being able to demote hooks and unscrew them and take them off and and throw them away. Um, Or you can say something like the vase broke, the vase broke. I don't know. I say both. Um, The vase broke. um, The this this could imply that maybe it just got too old and brittle and it kind of spontaneously broke. Maybe no one particularly did it. Um, I really love this alibi of building Gretchen. You know, I'm just saying, <laughs> it wasn't me. Uh, yeah, so this kind of ability to promote and demote things, which I think is super important because 
we don't often say sentences in a complete vacuum. That's the kind of thing that happens in like psycholinguistic experiments. You bring people into the lab, you play them a sentence, you show them a picture, and you say, what does this mean? Press a button. It always looks very nice in a linguistics textbook, and then you actually speak in the real world. Yeah, and in the real world, most of the time we say things with an established set of context. We have we have a story we're already bringing a sentence into, and that story already has people that are more and less important or already has people that are more and less familiar. And in a story, we want to highlight who is given information, who is not given information, who is already interesting to us for the purpose of the story, who isn't. So if the story is about, you know, here's all these types of things that about the vase versus if the story is about here's all the kinds of trouble that my dog got, got into – we might want to highlight different things. So we might want to hang the, the vase more prominently or, or make the hook for the dog more prominent. Yeah, exactly. Or like you can picture like, um, no, maybe a museum inscription is going to be like, well, this vase uh, clearly broke in, you know, 100 years ago. We can tell that by the cracks on it, blah, blah, blah. But maybe the museum doesn't know who broke it. And so it wouldn't make sense to be like someone clearly broke this vase, someone or something <laughs> unknown clearly broke this vase 100 years ago. We can tell this by the cracks. The important part here is this is the description of the, of the vase. But in other circumstances, we might want to highlight that. So I think, you know, there's this kind of bigger question like, okay, so verbs can support this whole scaffolding or this whole coat rack of a sentence. But what does it mean to have different types of hooks? Why would we want to be able to shuffle around how the coats are arranged on this metaphorical coat rack? And I think it's also important that we have one flexible coat rack instead of many different coat racks for every single context. And for some verbs, we do have this. So if you think about, like, the similarity or difference between, like, kill and die, mm. if someone dies, then you have one hook. And if someone kills another person, uh, you have two hooks. So I can't say I died you. No. Unless it means, like, I changed the color of you, but that's a completely it's different It's a completely word. different coat rack this time. <laughs> <laughs> so, whereas I can say, I killed you, it's harder to say, I killed, that implies I killed someone. Yes. Or some. It always implies that there's a second hook that's been removed. Um, and so, imagine if, for every single verb, every time we wanted to add a hook or remove a hook, we needed a completely different word. It's okay uh, with a handful. English can cope with a handful. Other languages might so um might have a handful mm -hmm. um or we might have verbs that so um in some languages kill and die are pretty much the same verb with some of those different extra affixes or particles you talked about so you could do something like i caused you to die or i made you die which then means i killed yeah. you so in shuba one of the languages i work with the verb for to scatter like to scatter grains mm -hmm. is just i caused grain to fall okay yeah, so it's that, using that I, I made it hook to mm -hmm. create an extra hook. Um, and so in some languages, things that are two different coat racks are just the same coat rack. But imagine if all languages had... Every single verb had like completely different form, like yep. kill versus die, or like push versus fall. So in some languages, like to push something is just I caused it to fall. Exactly. Um, and again, like imagine if every single pair of words, instead of saying I caused it to fall, I caused you to bake a cake for me. I had to say instead of you bake a cake for me, you like blorp a cake for me. And that that's is the, a completely different word. That is the best you, definition. <laughs> to blorp is to force, cause someone to make a cake for yeah. someone? Okay. That is correct. <laughs> so yeah, if you had to change it completely and blorp is even kind of so sounding similar to bake, but we know that push and fall and kill and die don't sound at all similar to each other. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be like florp or something like this. So you were talking about earlier how the words in a sentence aren't just little balls in a jar where they all just kind of go in and tumble around with each other. No, they have this wonderful coat rack structure. Or they could have another type of structure, which I started thinking about, which is, do you know those little plastic balls and beads and rods that you can get from like chemistry sets oh, i always liked it was one of the fun things about chemistry was how visual it was yeah so you can connect an oxygen and a hydrogen and you make like h2o and you have like two hydrogen molecules connecting to the one oxygen and these I mean, kinds of it's things it's been a long time since i've done <laughs> chemistry so i'm probably just going to agree with whatever you say here it's yeah it's been a long time since i did chemistry as well but i was thinking about it because different types of atoms like oxygen and hydrogen have different ways of connecting with each other that are kind of characteristic of those atoms and you can make these kinds of connections between those little balls kind of in a way that's similar to how you can make connections between how nouns connect onto verbs to form sentences. Oh, yeah. 
Like you have little sentence molecules. True. Like sentence is just kind of a word molecule. I like that. Yeah. And it turns out that I'm not the first person to notice this connection because there's a term for this type of phenomenon, uh, which is valency, which is used in both chemistry and linguistics. Ah. I, I mean, I know the word valency, and I just never ever thought about how that's also the word that they use for molecules in chemistry. Yeah. So this goes back to the 1800s when some linguist was looking over at chemistry and be like, they're doing all this stuff with valency about how little things connect with each other. Mm. Like, what if we borrowed this metaphor over here? And now we've kind of forgotten that these were once really connected. Who was that? Um, this was Charles uh, S. Pierce. Ah, there we go. Who uh, did, wrote a paper in 1897 about the connection here. And then it comes up in linguistics again a few decades later. And there's this kind of connection between, okay, how many, you know, how many other atoms can connect to this one and between how many other words can, can glom onto the sentence? How many nouns can we have on this verb? We need little, like, verb diagram structures the way that chemistry has those little atom structures. Yeah, because you can draw them both on paper. Like you can draw like atom bonds on paper and you can draw syntax trees to draw the connections between the words. But chemistry gets these great like plastic oh. manipulable tools. We should sell little mini coat racks. Oh my gosh. <laughs> New business plan. <laughs> little mini coat racks to draw your sentence trees on. <laughs> that would be delightful. That's definitely what we're not going to do. <laughs> For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Google Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. And you can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. You can get IPA scarves, IPA ties, and other Lingthusiasm merch at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee on Twitter. My blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Recent bonus topics include a video Q&A episode, given names, and a recording of our live show from Australia about how the internet is making English better. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire Gorn, our editorial producers are A.E. Prevot and Sarah Doppiarella, and our editorial manager is Emily Greff. Our music is Ancient Cities by The Triangles. Stay enthusiastic! Enthusiastic!